Good day there viewers, my name is Cliff and welcome to my channel called Vintage Time. Today we will be looking at faceting equipment part 2, but for those of you who missed the last episode of How to Cut Gemstones Faceting Equipment Part 1, we talked about a lot of questions and answers that people submitted to my channel. We did a brief tour around my faceting machine. We also discussed various other faceting machines where people said, well, what faceting machine should I buy? And I just provided a few tips. We also did maintenance uh, procedures on faceting machines and we also just looked at components. So let's move on to the second episode of Fastening Equipment Part 2. This is a common question people ask. Let's look at the cheetah. Most fastening machines have what we call a cheetah. And it allows you to do fine micro adjustments on facets, both to the left or to the right of the facet. And sometimes you need to use this when you're polishing. Sometimes a flat of a facet just won't polish, so you need to adjust the cheetah to the position where the facet's not polished. Sometimes you may do an undercut and you may need to just cheat a little bit to the left or right of a facet and just push down a bit harder just to get that perfect meet point. Let's talk quickly about how the cheetah works. I've just set the cutting angle to just a 45 degrees and I've got the stone just barely touching the disc and I've got the lock nut set on the fastening head assembly so it won't drop. Meanwhile, I've got the height adjuster zeroed in. Make sure you tighten the nut on the height adjuster so it's locked in, but loosen the nut on the fastening head assembly. Now I'm going to rotate the height adjuster, a full rotation from zero to zero clockwise, and it's going to be lowered by one millimeter, and I'm about to cut the facet set at 96 index wheel on a 600 grit disc. As I'm only cutting one facet in this demonstration, I'm cutting down to depth and you'll see how far I cut down, but I'm also listening to like a tick tick sound. Once it slowly stops ticking, then I know I've cut to depth. So I've cut to depth for one millimeter, which is from the base of the gem, the flat part you see at the bottom, to the outer perimeter of the gem, which is the girdle. But the actual faceting plane is wider, and that is because of the angle set. Just so you can visually see how the cheetah works, I'm just going to colour in this facet that I've just cut with a permanent texture. So now I'm rotating the gem back to its original position at the 96 index. From the original position I'm going to move the cheetah one notch to the left. So I'm going to draw in an arrow to demonstrate on the top of the gem which way the cheetah is cutting because we've actually got the facet on the underside of the gem and so we're cutting to the left of that facet. The height adjuster is in exactly the same position, hasn't been touched and I'm likely going to graze the gem across the 600 grit disc. So by cheating to the left you can now see where we've cut to the left side of the original facet. So by repeating the same process, we'll demonstrate how we cheat to the right of the original facet, which is underneath. So looking from an above view, you can see that I've cut slightly to the right by moving the cheetah one notch to the right. Another common question is The main function of the dop stick is that the gem needs to be attached to something so you can cut the actual facets at certain angles. Most dop sticks are made out of brass or stainless steel and sometimes they're even made out of wood. Most gems are attached to the dop stick by two part epoxy resins or wax. As you can see, there is a gem epoxy to the end of the dop stick and you'll also notice there is a slot cut into the dop stick. The slot on the dop stick will line up exactly with the 96 or 0 marker on the index wheel which is attached to the quill mount. By sliding in the dop stick, there's a hole that's also directly drilled in line with the 96 and 0 marker. 
By placing a pin in this hole, it will lock into the slot of the dop stick and that will immobilize it and then from the side I'll screw in a screw with an allen key and that will lock in the dop so it can't move anymore. So on to the next question. The index wheel serves a vital function on any fastening machine and serves a vital purpose. Index wheels come in a variety of different sizes. For my machine they come in a 60, 64 or 96 slotted wheel. Each slot on the index will determine what facet I cut. It will not determine the faceting angle as the protractor does this. So by choosing which slot by inserting the pin as seen, that will be the facet I will be cutting, but not the angle of that facet. As a side note, I've noticed that the less slots an index wheel has, the more accurate the fastening machine seems to be. It's interesting that faceting designers or manufacturers put very little time into the design of a motor on a fastening machine. As you can see by the size of my motor compared to the size of my hand, it's absolutely huge. This means I can cut any size gem possible and it will tear quickly through any size large gem. And you'll notice that some faceters will use a two-handed approach where they have to really push hard down on the plate. Well that means that the motor is not strong enough to cut those large gems when they're pressing down hard and all we're doing is stressing out the head on their fastening machine. Another design flaw I've noticed is that many machines house their motor in a box underneath the machine. So if you're living in a hot country like Australia, it's a very high tendency that motor would get overheated and that's why you're best to have the motor out in the open so it can ventilate. And in my opinion, the worst design flaw of all is that some manufacturers house the coolant unit right on top of the motor assembly. If that coolant unit leaks, you could be electrocuted. It's almost inevitable that at some point your belt will break or stretch and you need to replace it. Or simply, you might just want to have a spare belt. However, many faceting machine manufacturers sometimes go out of business and you can't order these belts anymore. So the only option you have is to make one. So you'll have to go to a specialist belt and pulley supplier and you'll have to buy these rubber belts. So this red belt is my spare belt which I made up and the way you connect both ends together is that you buy special little grommets that the pulley and belt suppliers will have but you need to heat the ends of the rubber belt up in hot water so it expands to push these grommets in. The downside is, is that these grommets make a clickety clack sound when running the machine. A handy little tip is that you have to be working with your fastening machine on a level surface. So get the level rule out and make sure everything is nice and level. And finally, a question that people ask me a lot is... This is a question people ask me all the time. Where do I learn to cut gemstones? How do I start? Where do I begin? And I'll give the same reply as I've always done in the comments. In my opinion, if it's possible, and some people can't due to locality or they just don't have the time to do it, the best way to learn how to cut gemstones is to join a local gem or lapidary club. There are always people on board who've got years of faceting experience and they're willing to help and teach you. Not only that, most gem clubs have their own fastening machines, so you don't need to go out and buy one straight away. In my case, when I first learned many years ago, I had an elderly gent teach me for the first year, and then I got picked up under the wing of an Australian fastening judge who'd learned for well over 10 years himself. So I got to learn all the tricks and the ins and outs of fastening, particularly meat point fastening, which is a really big deal in Australia. So I still don't know it all because I still join local workshops and they're one of the best things you can be part of also. If you can't join a club, try to join a guild or something like that. 
um, because they have workshops that you can attend a couple times a year and this is the one I'm joined with the Victorian Ambassadors group and even till this day I learn things there all the time at their workshops when I go another option is you can read books or you can look on YouTube on channels like myself but you know there are various ways of going about learning the process of faceting anyway this is the last of this episode and there'll be more episodes to follow so until next time take care and look after yourself bye for now